Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Media Roundtable on International Space Exercise Vulcan Guard and National Guard Space Operations. I'm Major Jennifer Staten, and I will be moderating today's event. This event is being recorded, and everything is on the record. The recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel following the conclusion of the event. Following today's opening statement, I will ask each of the reporters by outlet for questions. In the interest of time, please keep it to one question and one follow-up. If time permits, I'll come back around to the reporters for additional questions. The Zoom chat window will be monitored throughout today's event. A quick reminder to everyone to keep your microphones muted when you are not speaking. I'm honored to introduce today's panelists. We have Air Force Major General Richard Neely, Adjutant General, Illinois National Guard. This is a correction from the original advisory which mistakenly listed his service as Army. Army Major General Laura Clellan, Adjutant General, Colorado National Guard. Air Force Brigadier General Samuel Keener of the Air National Guard, Director of Joint Forces Development and Training, U.S. Space Command. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Ian Quack Harper, Space Operations Functional Area Manager and Exercise Planner for Vulcan Guard. Air Force Staff Sergeant Derva Polaru, Deputy Director of Joint Commercial Operations, Training and Exercise Division. With that, I'll turn it over to General Neely, sir. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Major General Rich Neely, the Adjutant General for the Illinois National Guard and Commander of the Illinois National Guard. For the last five and a half years, I've been known as the cyber tag, as the first Adjutant General who had a cyberspace operations background. As the Illinois tag with the technology background, I've served on numerous boards to include the Atlantic Council Geotech Committee. I'm the chairman of the Army National Guard Cyber Readiness Advisory Council, and I'm also a member of the National Guard Cyber General Officer Advisory Council. Prior to Governor Pritzker's appointing me as the Illinois Adjutant General, I was assigned to the Pentagon for the National Guard Bureau as the Deputy Director for Cyberspace and Space Operations. And was the Illinois and was the Air National Guard's chief information officer. During this assignment, I was responsible for the National Guard space portfolio, a portfolio I personally watched grow significantly from 2016 to 2018 as the Air Force asked the National Guard to take on new space mission. The National Guard has a proven track record with over 28 years of conducting space missions. Vulcan Guard was a great opportunity to work with our partners in NATO, including Poland and several other al allies who had joined us for this exercise. We reviewed lessons learned from the war in Ukraine, such as the use of space for, SpaceX's Starlink for drone warfare. Illinois does not have a space unit, but the National Guard's importance in space operations transcends the National Guard's space units. This is why we had so many cyber operators that were also involved with Vulcan Guard. The National Guard absolutely should remain in the Space Force mission. And this is not just important to those states that have the space units, but to the entire National Guard. If you look at the Department of Defense's space strategy, they clearly delineate four areas of focus. Prioritize cooperations with allies regarding space expand our warfighting advantage, develop and strengthen key relationships, and integrate commercial and interagency and academic partners. Looking at those four areas, I'd ask you, who else is better positioned to contribute to those four areas than the National Guard? In the National Guard, we have our state partnership program with more than 100 countries. We have our formal connections to all 50 states and territories and informal relationships across educational institutions, business groups at all levels, and we have our civilian acquired skills. We are known as a hometown military with an international reach. I'm proud that Illinois 30 year state partner, Poland, who played such an important role in this year's exercise, and I was able to be there to see this interaction. As the DOD says, cooperation with our allies is vital. We learn together. Defending against an attack in space has important implications, not just for our nation's military infrastructure, but our allies' military capabilities as well. For example, an attack against GPS or a global positioning system 
and time synchronization could affect our entire nation and democracies around the world. I'll quote Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks. Recent conflicts have starkly illustrated the indispensable role of space in our nation's de defense capabilities. Space has emerged as our most essential warfighting domain, integral to our national security, our coalition interoperability, and global stability. And this was the 10th of January this year. Vulcan Guard is an excellent illustration of the National Guard's importance in this critically important domain. I look forward to our discussion today on Vulcan Guard and the great partnerships and relationships the National Guard brings to the space domain. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. At this time, I'll open the, the questions up, starting with the New York Times. Uh, Eric Lipton. Yep, from the New York Times. Uh, just can you tell me about some of the tools that you guys have to, um, w when you talk about tactically responsive space, uh, you, in terms of, and also the mobility, I mean, I guess you're talking about moving um, jam ground based jammers, uh, but what other types of tools are, are you actually, do you have access to to play a role in the space defense efforts? General Keener, I'll open this question to you to begin. Hi, so uh, again, I'm uh, Brigadier General Sam Keener, the Director of uh, Joint Training and Education at U.S. Space Command. So the, the National Guard brings uh, several different capabilities uh, in that uh, in that arena to the to the fight. As you mentioned, uh, both the on the offensive side with the ground-based jammers, and then they're also standing up a defensive unit that helps uh, monitor and protect our own networks is probably the biggest uh, um, asset that we bring. I don't know if uh, Colonel Harper, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I would just add that we also um, operate uh, satellite communication constellation, MILSAR, and advanced EHF, as well as conduct missile warning missions, both in Colorado and Alaska. And our Alaska unit also uh, operates a radar that does space domain awareness that helps us uh, know where all objects are uh, floating in low Earth orbit. So um, we, we definitely contribute to that global picture with our guard capabilities. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, I'll transition questioning to NBC News. We'll come back to NBC. Colorado Springs Gazette. We'll come back to Colorado Springs Gazette. Task and purpose. Hi, um, thank you guys for doing this. Um, I was wondering if you can just talk a little bit now that um, it's, I, I believe the exercise is over, if you can talk about kind of some of the realistic training scenarios that were done. Uh, yes, ma'am. I will turn this over to Lieutenant Colonel Harper to initiate that conversation. Yes, ma'am. So we, uh, as part of this exercise, um, brought in realistic counter space threats from our uh, near peer adversaries uh, and how we believe they would employ those threats uh, in, in any sort of conflict. And that is how we uh, bring in realistic, um, you know, real time threats through our uh, modeling and simulation software that we execute in real time. So the operators would get uh, different injects across the week and have to take those in and take them into consideration with their mission planning efforts for both their uh, on orbit and ground uh, capabilities that they were planning for. Are you able to just say a little bit more like what one of the threats, kind of an example of example of one? Yeah, so we, we played out uh, kind of the whole gambit of Russian counter space capabilities from uh, reversible, uh, an example would be a, a ground based jamming non kinetic effects all the way up to uh, kinetic non-reversible effects such as a direct ascent anti-satellite weapon. Thank you, sir. Sergeant Polaru, do you have anything to add with that? 
course, um, kind of going alongside the uh, the topic of like near real time information, we were able to integrate uh, simulation uh, orbital data for the um, allied satellites as well as um, simulated air pair adversary satellites. And uh, we were able to send out this information in a simulation over live method. So the operators and the mission participants were able to see the entire big picture of the orbital um, constellation as we see it, both uh, geosynchronous and low Earth orbit. And uh, they were able to pick out key pieces of information for the satellites that they were uh, specifically interested in. So we were able to uh, combine that as well um, as simulation launch information as uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Harper had mentioned for the direct descent anti-satellite weapon system. So we were able to simulate all these different scenarios as well as combine them with live information to uh, provide a realistic picture for the participants to see and uh, conduct their mission planning with. Thanks. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll move to Politico. Uh, hi, thanks, Connor O'Brien uh, with Politico. Um, I'd love to direct this to um, to uh, Major General Neely and Major General Clellan. Um, just there's been a there's been a debate back and forth over the last few years about uh, the structure of Guard Space Forces and whether there should be a uh, whether there should be a separate uh, a separate Space Guard to directly supply the Space Force with uh, with uh, uh, guard space forces. Um, so, you know, what, if anything, did this tell you, I think about how the, how the structure, um, uh, is working and what needs to be done there and how forces are currently supplied to the space force. And just as a quick follow-up, your thoughts, if any, on the, the, uh, the air force's legislative proposal to just to authorize the, the secretary of the air force to transfer those air guard space missions to the space force. General well, Neely, will you kindly kick us off? Yeah, I sure will. And then I'll pass it over to uh, General Kellen uh, so she can uh, clean up whatever I might have missed. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. O'Brien, for that that question. And, and, you know, it's a very important question. It's something that as an adjutant general, and, you know, I, I mentioned early on uh, my background in space um, uh, is very important. I'm very passionate about the issue and the concern there that we've got significant capabilities uh, within uh, space missions right now. 28 years, uh, the National Guard has supported uh, the Air Force when space was uh, squarely in uh, the Air Force's um, service. And as it's transitioned to Space Force, um, you know, the National Guard action generals like myself um, are all very concerned that we uh, retain that capability, um, not only as uh, commanders of the National Guard, but really as taxpayers, uh, as someone who is a service member and that understands the capability uh, that the National Guard brings. And what do I mean by that? I mean, a thousand people currently today doing those missions and the uh, operational risk that we create um, when we move this completely away from the National Guard. Uh, what many don't fully understand is that it'll probably take $500 million to replicate and seven to 10 years to rebuild these units um, because when they transition out of the National Guard to the active duty, there's nobody to take that mission right now. And so you're creating a significant strategic gap uh, and, and really a uh, tactical gap uh, in operations when you're uh, when you're considering doing this. And and the concern is, is that the governors with this, you know, recent uh, legislative proposal, the governors wouldn't this would be sidestepping the governors to be able to have any input into that important conversation. Why should governors have important uh, input to that? Well, because of our capabilities being pulled away from states. Um, it is a mission that the governors are very familiar with and understand um, and, and can speak to. And so they should be part of that uh, debate uh, early on, just like we do all our other standard business. And so I think there's a really important uh, piece of this that, you know, Space National Guard should be there. This exercise, we, you know, shows really the importance of the 
the vital partnerships that the National Guard brings, the experience the National Guard brings um, to this. And if you all of a sudden take away that capability, which is where the Air Force is wanting to go, um, and you pull that out away from the National Guard, you now have a significant uh, risk. You won't have this capability. You just don't have those close relationships uh, with these different international partners like the National Guard does on top of our amazing space units that are doing incredible work today. So I'll pause there and uh, pass it to uh, General uh, Clowen uh, for further discussion. Thank you. Hey, thanks, uh, Joel Neely. Uh, you, you did a great job. Uh, I'll just fill in a couple of things. You know, Vulcan Guard was only possible because of the relationships the National Guard has with our partner nations through our state partnership program. Um, and if 480 were to go through, as, as Joel Neely said, uh, the DOD and the Space Force would have a very difficult time, even if they could replicate this exercise because the Guard wouldn't have space missions anymore and the Space Force wouldn't have the enduring relationships that, that we have as Guard with our state partners. You know, um, LP 480 would create this huge gap and, um, you know, just to throw out some numbers so you understand, uh, General Salzman testified last year that 33% of America's total space capacity resides in the Air National Guard space units. Um, and of that, 60% are uh, electromagnetic warfare capability. Um, so we conducted a poll uh, survey last February with all the space units in the National Guard, and there's about a thousand uh, airmen right now doing this mission. We found that between 60 to 86 percent of those service members said they would not transfer to the single component space force. Um, now, keep in mind, it takes about nine years to, to build a level seven space operator from the ground up. Uh, and the space force is only 8,600 military service members strong. So uh, those 1,000 in the Air National Guard that they're targeting would make up a substantial amount of their total end strength. And if up to 86% say they're not going to transfer over and it takes up to nine years to replace each one that doesn't transfer, that's going to create a huge gap in the capability of the Space Force that they will not be able to just fix by recruiting. And if I could just add one last thing that I, I missed, uh, for the Space National Guard to get stood up is a no cost to it would be absorbed inside the National Guard's top line of its budget. It's it's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in name tape changes and, and sign changes. It is nothing significant uh, for us to remain and operate this way, unlike standing up a separate Space Force capability that's not been proven and that would cost 500 million probably in equipment, hiring, um, establishing new facilities, all those kind of things. Uh, my question is, what's wrong with the status quo? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Inside Defense. Hi, thank you so much for um, hosting this. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit um, more about that legislative proposal. Um, I was hoping that you all could explain a little bit about how that transition would impact the specific work that um, you do. Thank you, ma'am. General Clawen, may I toss this one to you? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, as we said, it's gonna create a capability gap. The We are currently doing space missions um, 24-7, 365 days a year. Like I said, I've got electromagnetic warfare squadron overseas right now deployed doing a mission. Um, it's going to take that capability out of the guard. And as I said in you know my answer previously, uh, it takes if those folks don't transfer over, it's going to create a capability gap in talent um, that the Space Force is going to have a hard time recreating. Uh, and as Gerald Neely said, we can we can fix this. The solution is create a Space National Guard, allow us to continue to do the mission, and we won't have the capability gap. And it doesn't cost, you know, more than a couple hundred thousand dollars to transfer name tapes and guidons. 
Um, you know, I think the one thing that I'll point out about this legislative proposal and Governor Polis stated that it would set a dangerous precedent um, and it would jeopardize our national security in the removal of these capabilities from our National Guard. We would stop doing the mission if this goes through and the Space Force would have to pick it up and figure out how to do that. Um, and as I said, 86% of our force said they would not transfer over. Um, that's a huge gap. Uh, if, if these capabilities uh, are taken out, then the Space Force has to recreate and build those capabilities back into the Space Force. And that, as Joel Neely said, is the huge capability gap that uh, is ultimately going to affect our national defense. But, and the one thing I would Wait, add, would you like to add anything? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And, and the one thing I would add uh, to that is the, the new formation that the Space Force currently has, the active duty reserve uh, unique hybrid uh, is a new model. It's not really been tested before. It's not been utilized. This isn't like a standard uh, model. And so when when General Cullen talks about only a, a handful, a, a small percentage, about 15% of the Air National Guard members would consider going over, it's because of the uh, unique requirements to be on active duty so often and, and back and forth. It's very it's not very well structured. It hasn't been tested before. Again, I would ask, why would you move away from something that's working fine, that is working very well, where we're bringing forward 33%, as General Stoltzman had uh, said in testimony, where the National Guard has done an exceptional job in bringing 33%, one third of the space capability for the Space Force. Why would you change that um, and yank it away uh, from the National Guard who has you know, proven over the last 28 years to be a very successful partner. In that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. The Washington Times. We'll open it up to Kyoto News. Air Force Times. Army Magazine. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. Um, thank you so much for having this, you all. It's been really interesting to listen in on. Um, one thing that I'm curious about big picture wise is um, a lot of people have been speaking about lately how the next big war that we'll be involved in um, conflict will exist beyond conventional battlefields. So I would love to hear the Army Guard perspective on how we are incorporating that into our capabilities and our approach for future conflict. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I'll start with uh, General Neely, sir, if you have anything on that. Yes, I'll, you know, what, what I would say is, uh, you know, we're all seeing a, the non-kinetic effects of uh, the next war that's occurring. Uh, we're seeing that in the cyber domain, and we see uh, uh, parallel tracks to that um, as well um, in, in space. And that's why I think uh, uh, you're hearing people like the Deputy uh, Defense Secretary um, state uh, that the space war fighting, the, the, the space domain is our most important war fighting domain now. Uh, but I think uh, General Keener probably has a uh, the best insight on this, given his uh, experience and, and track record uh, with uh, space units and uh, at the Space Force. So I'll pause for his his comments. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. So before before I make any remarks, I'll uh, I'll. I'll pass to General Clallan because I think the the question was directed at the Army National Guard and and uh, and the Army capabilities for Salala. So I'll, uh, I'll pass it to my colleague, General Clallan. Thank you. Uh, so great question. Um, and and I'm fortunate enough to be the Adjutant General of an Army Guard state that has the only Army Space uh, National Guard battalion. 
Um, we have the 117th uh, Space Support Battalion in Colorado Springs that supports First Space Brigade. And there's also a reserve slice to that as well. And what we see right now is that the Army writ large, Compa 1, is wanting to put more um, force structure in those space support teams. Those small space support teams are made up of six people, and they have been uh, rotating through CENTCOM and UCOM nonstop. So the reserves and guard and first base brigade have been just constantly sending those capabilities forward. And I think the more we pivot toward a large scale combat operation, the more they're going to see the need to incorporate space uh, Combatant commanders absolutely see the need um, and the big army writ large is seeing the need because th they've just uh, said that they want to put more, more force structure in the space unit. So I think we'll see a growth in the army um, as, as it pertains to space capabilities and cyber as well. Thank you, ma'am. WHBF. Oh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Wren with WHBF. Uh, we were speaking earlier about uh, warfare moving into space. Do you, and I, and you're, spe you're speculating here. Do you think that might be an end to more land-based conflict like we've seen through the centuries, just everything moving into cyberspace and outer space? General Keener, sir, do you have any insights on that? Sure, I'll start off. Uh, so I, to answer your question, I, I don't think that uh, precludes or or shows that uh, um, conflicts on the terrestrial or then in the uh, oceans or anything like that would change. I think what uh, what we're seeing is that uh, our adversaries have spent the last several decades studying um, how the U.S. and its allies go to war and uh, in, in focusing their uh, capabilities on mitigating our advantages. And uh, I think space and cyber um, are both uh, advantages for the U.S. and our allied partners. And uh, I think that's why our adversaries are focusing on those capabilities at, um, at the beginning of a conflict and throughout the conflict. But I don't think it will change um, what happens uh, in the remainder of uh, any potential conflict, whether it's in the Indo-PACOM area or in UCOM. If I could add just a little bit more to that, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, General Keener has it exactly right. And what we're seeing is more gray zone warfare, right, before we go kinetic. Uh, and we're seeing our adversaries taking advantage of that, knowing that uh, the United States and many of its allies really are dependent upon the technology that we use through our critical infrastructure, through uh, our uh, our space capabilities and assets that we have there, uh, that it becomes a little bit of, uh, it becomes more of a, um, a challenge for us to defend so much uh, of our critical infrastructure. And so what we're seeing is our uh, allies, uh, or excuse me, our adversaries starting to look for our weaknesses in those particular areas uh, that they may be able to take advantage uh, of um, even prior to uh, the kinetic uh, portion of the, of the war or a, a, you know, a war that may never go kinetic. You know, we could see, you know, it, like we are now in cyberspace attacks happening um, from, uh, you know, our adversaries around the world, uh, even prior or even if a conflict, a hot conflict doesn't break out. So uh, hopefully that, that helps you a little bit with that, that answer. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, we have time for one more question. PBS. Signal Magazine. Air and Space Forces Magazine. Hi, can well, you hear me? Oh, oh, yes, ma'am, we got you. Hi, can you yes, hear me? Sorry. This is uh, Kimberly Underwood from Signal Magazine. Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. No worries, um, we've got you. Thanks for your time today. I wanted to ask, um, kind of what were the challenges with Vulcan Guard of integrating, um, you know, intelligence and cyber, especially 
across, um, you know, the different guards and then the NATO partners. And kind of how did you work that out that maybe was different than before or building on kind of what you had done before? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sergeant Polaru, will you start us with that, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so Sergeant Polaru, in, uh, I worked with the Joint Commercial Operations uh, Training and Exercise Division. Uh, within the name of that uh, cell, Joint Commercial Operations, we focus on commercially uh, available, um, commercially off the shelf available information, publicly available information. So the foundation of that that mission set is is non classified. It's not government data. Um, just the cells are government ran. So the information itself has a non classified base to it. Um, that makes it the easiest and most shareable mission set uh, to any foreign partners or potential partners and allies, um, uh, members of that sort. So we were able to um, combine both simulation and uh, live information from these uh, orbital tracks that we were able to get from our commercial data providers and combine them with uh, publicly available information to gain context and work with the uh, Vulcan Guard um, internal white cell or uh, mission planning or uh, the exercise planning teams to then uh, you know simulate and bring out the 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 injects for our uh, member nations and I can uh, pass that over to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Harper to expand on that. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, to be uh, specific about Vulcan Guard and some of the challenges, so we bring in uh, cyber intelligence and space operations professionals that are really uh, tactical experts in their fields or in their uh, weapon system that they operate. And so Vulcan Guard is an opportunity for them to really look at how the other uh, capabilities in those three fields operate, uh, what their planning and processes are, uh, how they can integrate together with you, what are their capabilities and limitations. And so I think that's, you know, it's both a challenge, but something that we try to bring out in Vulcan Guard so that when they go into planning for a contingency or crisis, that they understand uh, kind of the whole gambit of what goes into to planning for, for both space, cyber, or sorry, for all three, space, cyber, and Intel. Uh, and, and can achieve a, a greater effectiveness uh, together in, in understanding how those three pieces come together. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. That's Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much to our panel members for your time and expertise and to the reporters for taking the time out of your day to talk about this important exercise and National Guard space operations. If any of you have additional questions that were not addressed today, please reach out to the National Guard Bureau Public Affairs Media Team and we will run down answers for you. You can find the email address pasted into the chat window. A transcript of this roundtable will be posted on nationalguard.mil later today and the recording will be uploaded to the NGB YouTube page. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us.